Hi, I'm Virginia Postrel, the author of The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. This video is one of a series inspired by my book. I hope you'll check them all out and, of course, read the book. Enjoy! Hi, today I'm out visiting some of our local prickly pear cactuses, starting with this imaginative rendition in West Hollywood by artist James Peterson. To find out why his color choices might be especially meaningful, why the white rust on the metal frame makes the cactus a little more realistic, and what it all has to do with textiles, stay tuned. Red is primal. After black and white, red is the first color to which humans give a name. In the Hebrew Bible, the word for red shares a root with the words for earth, blood, and human. Red is the color of power and passion, the color of fire, the color of vitality and good fortune, and the color of warning. Red captures our attention. It's the most popular color on the world's flags. People have dyed cloth red since ancient times, most often using a plant called matter. Before the invention of synthetic dyes in the 19th century, the richest, most luxurious reds didn't come from plants. They came from tiny, parasitic bugs known as scale insects. These insects secrete red substances, and they can be cleaned, dried, and ground into dye stuffs. In different parts of the world, people use different species. In India, they used lac, the same bug-produced resin from which we get shellac. In Europe, they used kermes, which they also called grana because the dried bugs look like grain. Before the early 1500s, people in these places hadn't yet discovered nature's best red dye. It's called cochineal, from the Spanish word for scarlet colored, and it came from what is now southern Mexico. You can find wild cochineal throughout the southwestern United States, Mexico, and Central America. Look for white patches on prickly pear cactuses. If you scrape them, you'll see the red. Wild cochineal is a pest, sucking the life out of the plant's edible leaves and fruit. But indigenous farmers turned that pest into a valuable crop. In dedicated cactus patches, they bred a distinctive species that required human tending. Their cochineal produced 10 times as much red as European kermes. Cochineal was also brighter, more color fast and easier to use. The Spanish were excited to discover this treasure. When conquistador Hernando Cortes told Charles V about it, the king ordered him to cause as much as possible to be collected. Like the Aztecs before them, the Spanish conquerors demanded cochineal as tribute from the farmers who grew it. By the mid 16th century, the dye stuff had become one of New Spain's most valuable exports. The demand in Europe was so great that tribute alone couldn't satisfy it. Cochineal farming became a lucrative commercial venture, so much so that it upset the social hierarchy. In 1553, the ruling council of the town of Tlaxcala complained that the peasants were making too much money growing cochineal. They were getting uppity. These elites, who had also been in charge before the Spanish arrived, didn't like the way the cochineal nouveau riche were spending their money. Both the cactus owners and the cochineal dealers, some of them, sleep on cotton mats, and their wives wear great skirts, and they have much money, cacao, and clothing, they complained. The wealth they have only makes them proud and swaggering, for before cochineal was known and everyone planted cochineal cactus, it was not this way. Cochineal had been known for centuries, of course. What was new was the entrepreneurial opportunity to serve a large overseas market. By 1600, the New World insect had become an essential dye stuff in Europe, completely displacing kermes. Over a period of about 50 years, the price in Europe of cochineal quadrupled, even as quantities increased. Spain was determined to hold on to its lucrative cochineal monopoly so it prohibited foreign ships from carrying the precious dye stuff. Pirates and smugglers worked to break that stranglehold. English privateers were a particular threat. They loved to attack Spain's cochineal-bearing ships. The two countries were in a Cold War, and Queen Elizabeth encouraged the raids. In 1597, the Queen's favorite, Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, 
captured three Spanish ships and brought home more than 27 tons of cochineal. The queen rewarded Essex lavishly. She granted him a large share of the cochineal outright and let him buy the rest at a steep discount. She then let him corner the market by prohibiting all cochineal imports for the next two years. In the portrait painted soon afterwards, Essex posed in a rich scarlet robe, no doubt dyed with the New World Red. Trying to break Spain's monopoly, people smuggled cochineal out of Mexico, the Caribbean islands, and tropical locales in Europe and Asia. But it never really took. Raising cochineal was an art, and the insects were hard to keep alive. You can still find remnants of those efforts in places like Sicily, where prickly pears have become part of the local cuisine. Street vendors sell the largest, juiciest fruits as bastordoni, or big bastards. For the next two and a half centuries, New Spain's cochineal remained the world's most precious source of red. The cloth it dyed was a sign of wealth and prestige. Cochineal colored the robes of Catholic cardinals and English judges. Aristocrats dressed for portraits in scarlet clothing and posed in front of cochineal dyed drapery. Cochineal provided the crimson for British Army officers' red coats and country gentlemen's riding habits. Japanese samurai adopted it for their outer garments. If you really wanted to show off, you could dress your children in it. The coat Tucker is modeling is about 250 years old. It's made of worsted wool dyed with cochineal and the fabric looks brand new. Of course, cochineal coats weren't designed for rough and tumble play. You took good care of such a treasure. Independence, not foreign competition, finally destroyed Spain's monopoly. In 1821, Mexico and Guatemala broke away from their colonial masters. Two years later, Guatemala declared itself an independent republic and became the world capital of cochineal production. Later in the 19th century, Spain briefly reclaimed the cochineal trade by pressuring farmers in the Canary Islands to grow the crop. In 1876, they exported a record 2,722 tons, just as synthetic dyes were beginning to take over the market. Today, the once precious dye stuff has a niche market as a natural coloring for food and cosmetics, if customers aren't too squeamish about crushed bugs. Cochineal is still popular with people who like experimenting with natural dyes. In my next video, I'll give it a shot. For more textile stories, be sure to watch my other videos. And don't forget to read The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World.